two and a half years. Uh, I studied uh, sustainable development and resource management, uh, focusing on water resource and uh, sustainable landfill. I came uh, born and raised in Southern California, Palm Desert, uh, then San Diego, and then Orange County. So I'm pretty familiar with the area. Uh, I moved to San Francisco for my undergrad. Uh, this was just before the 2008 Great Recession, before Facebook and all of that stuff. So I got a good taste of um, the Bay Area and um, left a few years later um, and I got my master's degree in London. So I got to study uh, the European way of doing resource management. And again, we'll kind of get into this a little bit. Uh, it's, it's much different because of the space. Uh, we have way more space than forces them to do different things with their materials. Uh, and I did my thesis on uh, public-private partnerships uh, and a sustainable landfill in the uh, side of the region. Um, let's see if we can get uh, this presentation kicked up. And what I'm going to talk about is waste management. Uh, obviously, I'll do a little plug about all the great things we do. We are North America's largest uh, recycling a company, so we touch a lot of materials. So I'll kind of get into that a little bit. And then we're going to bring it to California. California is now the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, and as such, we have pretty stringent economic and, uh, policies. So I'll talk about that and how that ultimately affects your lives um, and businesses here in California. And then I'll kind of go broad and I'll talk about the global market so you guys can kind of have a good understanding of what's actually driving these materials. Um, let's see if I can do this
Minecraft programs for, for commercial businesses. Um, and the way bottom is kind of cool. Um, we do wildlife habitat programs and restoration projects. Ultimately, when you have a landfill as part of the life cycle, the landfill is turned into a park or, or wildlife restoration. If you guys haven't seen the three landfills in Orange County, I highly recommend taking a tour. Um, they are some of the most sustainable landfills in the nation. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing to see. Um, and uh, all of our vehicles uh, are natural gas. So I won't bore you guys too much, but if you guys have questions, absolutely at the end. And you might have already heard of some of these laws. Um, one of the earliest ones is AB Assembly Bill 939 which ultimately rolled out recycling in California. Uh, this was uh, late 80s, early 90s, when that law came up and it gave jurisdictions a mandate of 50%. So 50% of the things that a jurisdiction or state dispose of can't go to a landfill. So ultimately, recycling was born. Um, it went a little bit stricter with 341, which ultimately mandated it for commercial properties and multifamily, um, and it increased it 75% reduction uh, by 2020, um, and it doesn't change the original 50%. So, AB 341, Assembly Bill 341, is why your commercial business is recycled today. If they had an option, you would only get the corporate social responsibility, the, the, the stewards of the environment recycling. Other than that, everyone would throw things away because it's cheaper. The organic law that I mentioned was Assembly Bill 1826. Um, Jerry, Governor uh, Brown, did it in 2014 and went into effect in 2016. And it mandated commercial businesses and multifamily properties to get uh, to dispose of, of their organics outside of the waste stream. Organics also means green waste. So when I say multifamily properties, if any of you live in a, a multi-unit property, it's not your food waste that they're after, it's your landscape to make sure that it doesn't go into the trash. Um, but for commercial businesses, they don't really have landscaping unless they're in a plaza, um, so it's, it's food waste. Um, it's, it's hard because you have post and pre-consumer. Um, you know, again, I can talk to you guys about organics a little bit later, but it's a big, it, a lot of focus in California right now is, is on organics. Um, to give you guys a sense of throwing things away. Um, I think that was a fabulous presentation about some of the materials that we run into on a daily basis. Um, every year in Orange County alone, we uh, dispose of uh, almost uh, four and a half million tons of trash in our landfills. It can fill the Angel Stadium five times a year or the Honda Center seven times. So it's a lot. Um, the plus side is that we're actually recycling more than that. So because we have those mandates, um, but still a lot of materials going to the landfill. Um, on the broader scale, so that we kind of talked about California a little bit, on the global uh, recycling industry, that market, China dominated for many years. And ultimately the reason why China dominated is because they built a lot of mills. They had cheap labor, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and they didn't have any feedstock um, to power those mills. So they wanted the global um, supply of cardboard and paper. And, to, and ultimately what happened is the world fell into this kind of system where we would throw away everything, our envelopes with the little clear plastic windows, all of that stuff would go to China. They would grind it up uh, and ship it back, the raw materials. So we would literally be sending trash across the country, uh, across the world, and it would come back to us. Well, uh, communism is real, and the way that they're able to change their laws can happen like that. And they implemented a law last year, which uh, ultimately shut down. Uh, they, they called it Operation Blue Sky, um, and it, it changed. They, their focus is now on their environment, so they closed down the mills, and they're they're doing a great sustainable thing for China. They're disposing of so many items that now they can be a closed loop system. They don't need the world's trash anymore. They have their own trash. But what happens is that now we don't have anywhere to bring all of our materials. The U.S. doesn't have a lot of mills. We have some paper mills, but in California, it's very hard to get something permitted because of our air quality. Um, so 
Ultimately, the ban started with mixed paper and mixed plastic. Mixed paper is some of the stuff that you guys look at today. The envelopes, if you ripped a piece of paper right now and it changes from the A4 size to just pieces of paper, that's mixed paper. The magazines, things like that, is no longer an easy market for it. Uh, mixed plastics is all of the plastics that fall out of the, the easily recyclable ones. So the one through seven, the little triangles, those are generally have a market for it. Um, there's hard plastics as well, such as toys, lawn furniture, uh, lawn chairs, crates, things like that. There's still a market. But then all of the other plastics don't really have a home in form. Uh, they also did a contamination threshold. Again, contamination means it could be like a banana in your recycling, or it could be a material that's not in that bale. So if you have a bale of cardboard, you're trying to sell that. And in that cardboard, you have a Tonka truck toy, that's considered contamination. So out of a, 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 a 2,000 pound bale, only 0.5 of it can be contamination, which is an incredibly strict. It basically was a law that no one could really handle. Um, and they also suspended and closed a lot of their, their um, The global impacts, like we kind of talked about, this is um, you know waste management um, per year. Uh, ships about, used to ship about 30% of its paper um, around the world. Um, a lot of that's coming back to our uh, internal markets. Um, the European Union uh, does do almost all of their plastics to China, and that had to change. Now, ultimately, we have uh, 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 countries in um, this area of the world and this area of the world that's ultimately taking the brunt. Um, and now, following in China's footsteps, opening up mills, but the price of these materials have changed. Uh, this, uh, oh, this is Operation Blue Sky, what I talked about. But the trickle down is now cities are having their programs kind of upended, right? Uh, waste haulers used to accept everything. Now you have areas like the Pacific Northwest, uh, Portland, and Seattle, they, they didn't have a home for their paper. A lot of their paper actually went to the landfill. They couldn't find a market for um, and here in Orange County, because we have the port of Long Beach, it's a little easier for us to get material out. So a lot of your haulers here are really just focusing on cleaning it up. If you have CRNR, Waste Management, Republic, any of the larger ones, Edco in Orange County, you'll see us talk about you know keep it dry, uh, keep it loose, try to keep the plastic bags out. We're trying to get that 0.5 percent contamination under wraps. Um, it hasn't gotten to the point where we're banning materials out of your recycling stream. Um, but in our other areas of the country, that's not necessarily the case. So this is kind of what we talked about, that educational campaign. You might even see contamination notices. Um, this is something that was built in. Um, on the residential side, in very few cities, um, Santa Ana, and well, I live in Santa Ana, um, it's a unique makeup, so they do have a residential contamination charge. Um, most other jurisdictions, if you throw something in, uh, they'll just tell you, hey, you can't collect it until you take it out. So you won't really be charged. Um, on the commercial side, it's different. Though. There are charges that are being rolled out if you own a business. Um, and ultimately, we're just looking at bringing it back to the basics. Um, you can't keep up with industries. Consumerism is providing uh, this endless feedstock of just these new materials that there are no markets for. Um, the plastic bag, um, I'm just going to jump into this real quick and uh, there will probably be questions about this, plastic bag recycling. So in our contracts for waste management, we collect, we do recycle, but as you can see, um, the capture rate for plastic bags um, is, it can be very dismal. Um, we have mach machinery that ultimately rip plastic bags for a reason because people are throwing their recycling, tying it up, and then chucking it into the trash can. Well, how are we going to access that? those recyclables, we got to rip the bag open. Um, what we recommend if you really don't want to take your plastic bags to a grocery store and you just want to throw them in your recycling, bundle them up until you have a big like basketball size and then throw them in so our sort pickers can see them easily. If they're loose, there's a really good chance that they're going to be managed. Um, ultimately, if you're looking for the nearest plastic bag, um, third party, um, most CVSs will collect them where houses are sprouts, things like that. Um, but the idea of plastic bags around the nation, most haulers don't accept them. But because our contracts and we have these landfills, they're 
bold than and people. Orange County is a unique market, over, so we do accept plastic bags, um, at least for waste management. Um, I wanted to show a quick video because a lot of the things I'm talking about and what we're talking about is pretty heavy. Um, I'm sure you guys have known that there's um, a big plastic garbage patch that's floating out on the Pacific. Um, it's the largest one that's off the Pacific. There's actually five of them, four or five of them in the world. Uh, this, they launched their pilot program on uh, September 8th, so it's, it's pretty recent. Um, but if you haven't seen this company, it's, it's phenomenal. They're a Dutch company. Um, it's called Ocean Cleanup. And I wanted to kind of, you know, bring some positivity to our conversation. Um, as far as water resource management and landfills, if you guys have ever seen it, um, you know, ocean plastics is real. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard that by 2050 there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than, than life um, you know, by weight. So that's, that's a pretty scary uh, statistic. Um, but this company um, is uh, founded by an 18 year old in um, the Netherlands, um, but they did the pilot from Alameda in San Francisco. So hopefully it will work. get this going, but it's just like a two little minute thing and it gives you guys a nice little understanding of uh It kind of depends if the video is embedded in the PowerPoint or if it's uh, if it's external. If it's external and you didn't copy it with it, then it may not work. It should have been embedded, but if not, then it's, what I can try to do. Yeah, if you usually if you mouse over it, then it should show the play button, but yeah, if it's not, then... I'll see. There were buttons down to the left. Oh, yeah, maybe maybe look at that again. Okay. Yeah, well, we're lucky we have one button, so I can actually just pull it up on YouTube. And again, it's just, it's kind of a, an educational. All right. There it goes, guys. <laughs> One of the pieces of plastic float at the surface of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here, the ocean cleanup is deploying the world's first technological solution to this growing problem. The principle behind it is simple. Create a coastline where there are none. Concentrate plastic and take it out. The system consists of a 600 meter long floater and a 3 meter deep skirt attached below. The floater provides buoyancy to the system and prevents plastic from flowing over it, while the skirt prevents smaller particles from escaping underneath. As the impenetrable skirt creates a downward flow, marine life can safely pass beneath it. Here is how the system catches plastic. The system takes advantage of three natural oceanic forces, winds, waves, and currents. Both the plastic and system are being carried by the current. However, wind and waves propel the system only, as the floater partly sticks above the surface, while plastic is primarily just beneath it. The system thus moves faster than the plastic, allowing the plastic to be captured. The skirt extends deeper in the middle of the system than on the outer edges. As the current applies pressure on the skirt, the system naturally adopts a U-shape, which enables it to concentrate plastic in its center, like a funnel. The drag generated by the skirt also acts as a stabilizing force, allowing the system to reorient itself when the wind changes direction. And because the system, like the plastic, is free-floating, it automatically drifts to the areas with the highest plastic concentration. Fitted with solar-powered lights, anti-collision systems, cameras, sensors, and satellite antennas, the system actively communicates its position at all times and continuously gathers performance data. Periodically, a support vessel comes by to take out the concentrated plastic, like a garbage truck of the ocean. The plastic is then transported to land, recycled, and made into durable products. This is the first of a fleet of 60 systems. Once deployed, 
the fleet is expected to clean up 50% of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch every five years. So I, I thought that would be a good transition because the next speaker that we're going to be hearing uh, works on
this is kind of a daunting chart. I'm happy to provide it to you uh, afterwards. But in, sum in summation, if we're just looking at PET bottles and jars in this country, per year we have 5.6 billion pounds of virgin production. So virgin production means straight from fossil fuels, straight from natural gas. That 5.6 billion pounds equates to about 19, 119 billion units, which equates to about one unit per U.S. citizen per day. 4.2 billion pounds of that PET was landfilled, about 75%. 1.8 billion pounds, or 32% of that virgin production, was actually recycled. And in the industry, we call, we call it recycled um, PET our pet. Now, something that I'm going to talk to you about today is mainly bottled bottle recycling. And that's where one bottle gets made into another bottle. That's only having 6.2% 6 6 of our virgin production material that flows into this country. Only 6.2% of it actually gets recycled into another bottle. I was, I was at a talk, I was at a meeting last week in the Midwest, and a gentleman said it quite aptly. He said, recycling is a 50-year industry that's still an emerging industry. We still have a long way to go. Back to this chart. Of, of the 32, of, of the percentage that we do recycle, the majority of it is going here into fiber. Fiber mainly goes to China. Uh, it go, gets downcycled into uh, fleece, or it gets sent to uh, Georgia, it gets made into carpet. So, like I said, the recycled majority gets downcycled. Now, I know a lot of you might not know what the term downcycled is. So, let's look at a definition. So, the, the definition of downcycled is to recycle something in such a way that the resulting product is of lower value. The noun for this down cycle is a cycle or a part of a cycle marked by decline, decrease, or deterioration. My personal definition is to, de to de delay the inevitable. Uh, it's basically to go to landfill. Downcycling extends use of material, yes, but only by one. It perpetuates landfilling. It prevents virgin plastic source reduction, which is uh, important to some of our, our climate change colleagues and advocates. It reduces the amount of recycled feedstock for, for bottle to bottle. And in the end, it minimizes damage and is less bad. But personally, I don't want to live in a world that's less bad. I want to live in a world that's more good. So let's talk about upcycling. To upcycle something is the inverse of downcycling something. It's to recycle something in such a way that the resulting product is of high value. So as, up, as upcycling relates to this product, that's what we're focused on, let's, let's see what that looks like. There's many forms of upcycling. Um, in the last presentation, there was mention of bags being upcycled into lumber. That's a, that, that's a, a, a source of upcycling. But I want to talk about bottle to bottle recycling. Bottle to bottle recycling, also called closed root recycling, also called crater to crater recycling, is when used bottles are actually made into new bottles. And as mentioned before, only 6.2% of virgin feedstock in this country goes bottle to bottle. And only 20% of what we're recycling goes into that. Bottle to bottle eliminates our concept of waste and reduces virgin plastic source production. I have the privilege of working with some top brands who, in portions of the organization, are committed to driving bottle to bottle recycling. A lot of these brands, and rightly so, are under heavy pressure by consumer advocates such as us, by governments, to do their part and to take responsibility for the brands they put out in the market. We have created an amazing economy, one econ an economy that I consider a linear economy, and it's time for us to drive an economy that is circular so that products that are actually made and used can actually be 
remade into new products. Rather, in a, learn a linear economy where products are made and used and dumped. And I firmly believe that one day, every brand will be held responsible for the products they put out in the marketplace. Not only it's something that they should do, but I think it's good for their business as well. If I could switch over to, uh, I, put together, I put together a chart. So, the state of California requires every major consumer brand that sells a beverage product into the state to submit their data every year. No one really knows about it, but I got my hand on the report and I put it into a chart like this. This shows you all your favorite brands and the amount of recycled plastic they're using in their, in their products. So you can see Calafia, they use 100% virgin material. Evolution, which is owned by Starbucks, uses 100% virgin material, no recycled feedstock. Let me just scroll down here. Fiji Waters, 0% recycled feedstock. So only the big guys really right now. Nestle Waters is using 32%. So your Arrowhead water bottle has 32% recycled plastic in there. Niagara Water, who supplies Kirkland bottled water, we have about a 10% recycled plastic in there. Martinelli's, your apple juice that used to be in glass. <coughs> Whole Foods, talking right. So the majority of consumer brands today are not using recycled content. It has to do with a factor of price. It also do a factor with uh, the amount of recycled PET on the market that can go bottle to bottle. One of the major factors that dictate that price are the systems that we create in this country. Indra Nuri, the outgoing CEO of PepsiCo, has committed to incorporating more PET in her packages if it were available. So I want to introduce you on paper to two recovery systems. And this, this chart was put out by CalRecycle. I did not make it. So it shows you the flow from use. So that use can be at your house or it can be in your business. And it, two different flows to the reclaimer here. And that reclaimer could be someone who's making it into carpet, someone who's making it into fleece, or someone who's making it into another bottle. <coughs> if it's staying in state, it's most likely to be made, being made into another bottle. California, we have started developing the infrastructure to take PET bottle to bottle. There's a facility in uh, Riverside called Carbon Light, and they take material bottle to bottle. I was just at an opening of another site that opened in Vernon two weeks ago that they're going to do the same thing. So we're very lucky in this state to have that infrastructure. It doesn't exist really in the middle of the state in the middle of the country, uh, and it exists up on the, the other coast. So let's look at both of these. So the first flow is you use a product, you use bottled water or drink coconut water, and you're going to drop it off at a recycling center. Most likely when you drop it off at that recycling center, it's going to be source separated, meaning not mixed with other plastic types or material types. I personally take my material to Allen Company in Santa Ana, and when I get there, I have to sort my PET from my HDPE to my aluminum. That material is baled on site, baled, source separated. This flow has a greater chance, the material that flows through this flow has a greater chance of going to bottle to bottle. Here's the most common flow that we all use and it's used in uh, other states. Curbside pickup goes to a material recovery facility um, and then that material is sorted mechanically and then sent off to reclaimers.
at the end of the day, I don't see this material as waste. I see this material as nutrients. And so I envision a world where we move from waste management to nutrient management. And nutrient management that is incorporated back by the brands. And this could be a PET bottle, PET plastic that goes back to Coca-Cola. This can be recycled copper that goes back into an iPhone. Uh, and that's the system that I'm working to drive. So this is the company that I started. I've been obsessed with this space since I was a kid. I had the privilege of working with for waste management um, starting 10 years ago out of business school. I learned a lot. Um, and now I'm driving Replenish to unlock the value of this material in our communities. Just PET alone, just PET bottles that I talked about today, we, we, we landfill $850 million worth of PET. That's one material type, one product use type. How can we envision a world where billions and billions of dollars are recycled, upcycled, and the nutrients are used infinitely, and our communities benefit from that material? And as mentioned, I'm working with major consumer brands to drive this change, for them to incorporate that feedstock into their packaging and their products, and to drive new recovery models. And we're building technology to empower entrepreneurs to earn additional income, and to drive this new model. So what can you do? Roger asked me when I talked, Roger's like, tell me what I can actually do. So I, can, I would ask you to consider the system of recovery and destination of the material. When it comes specifically to PET, for PET bottles, I would contemplate dropping off at local centers. If dropping off in centers is not convenient, I would pay the material forward. I have a neighbor around the corner, he's an elder, elderly gentleman, and he can't get to a drop-off center. But every trash day, he leaves his PET water bottles in a small little bag next to his trash can. And the local peddler comes around and picks that material up every day. I love that. I consider that paying forward. You can also pressure your favorite brand, I mentioned some of what I showed you in that chart, to incorporate recycled PET or RPET in your packaging. Thank you. Are most of you folks from Irvine? No. Okay. Where are you guys from? 
Brooklyn. Huntington Beach. Huntington Beach. Laguna Niguel. Laguna Niguel. That's Mesa. one of our cities, by the way. Costa Mesa. Costa Mesa, that's one of our cities. Fullerton. Fullerton. Okay. That's great. Santa Margarita. Santa Margarita. Brandon Park. Brandon Park. Anybody in here uh, use our service residentially? Like Raise up your hand if you do. If you use CRR service. Okay, that's great. It's fantastic. We have a lot of city contracts here. What I'm going to talk about is recycling at the lower level. These guys are giving me more of a worldwide thing. I'm going to talk about the MRF system where we do the sorting of that material from ground level. Okay? And we're going to talk about a couple of commodities here. Uh, what we do with it and pretty much the markets that we're currently uh, selling this material to. Um, we'll start with the number one plastic. You guys are all familiar with this for the most part. Usually your water bottles for the most part. Okay. Um, very durable. Most of this material up here used to be glass. You remember maybe about 20 years ago you used to walk down your aisle where the mayonnaise and everything was and almost everything was in glass. Now it's in plastic. Plastic is durable. I can drop this. Not a problem. Drop some glass, you got, you know, a hazardous situation. All right? So this type of material, PET, obviously can be turned back into bottles. Um, and clothing. A lot of this is for clothing. It's recycled as clothing. Then we go on to number two. This is your... Uh, PET, we got to go on the HDP. And again, I'm not going to hold you guys very long because I know you want your Q&A. And these guys did such a fabulous job of covering everything that I won't need to really dwell, dwell into any, you know, go any further with anything because they, they pretty much handle it. This is HDPE. Okay? HDPE uh, natural. HDPE color. Same commodity, but one's color, one's natural. Also good commodities. And these commodities, again, uh, a lot of this material can be used for plastic lumber. When you go to uh, Home Depot and you see the plastic lumber, it's primarily made out of HDPE plastic and film plastic. Okay, very doable plastic. Uh, recycle bins and play, uh, playground equipment that you can use this material for. Now. If you take these two, and let's talk about, we're going to skip on to, to uh, number five. This is a poly, uh, poly, uh, propylene. Poly, polypropylene is as durable as HDPE, almost exactly the same. It can turn into bottles, you can turn into buckets, just about anything. Okay. Now, if I took these plastics here, PET, HDPE, uh, uh, polypropylene. This is a one, these are twos, and this is a five. <coughs> Still an exceptional market for it, right? And this is going to really surprise you. We haven't sold PET or HDPE overseas probably in the last two and a half, three years. There's a really good market for this material here. It has been for quite some time. So keep that in mind. Because everybody's thinking that all the plastics are going to China. China's taking the plastic and throwing it in the ocean. And then, you know, creating havoc for, for, for fish and, you know, other wildlife. Right? It's not happening with these two items. There's a tremendous market here for that. Now, number three, I was not able to get you a, a, a sample. It's uh, PVC. And you guys all know what PVC is. Usually the PVC piping. Right? Uh, polycarbon vinyl, I think it is, um, a poisonous type plastic. If you burn that plastic with a match, instead of getting a white smoke or a clear smoke, you got to get a black smoke. So whenever you're burning a plastic and you get a black smoke, that means that plastic is sending out poisonous gas. So you can't take that plastic really and mix it with anything else. For the most part. Now we're going to go on to um, number four, which is film 
plastic. Okay? The last two or three years, big problem. With the film, with the styrofoam. This is the number six. So, you've been hearing in the news, you've been reading the newspaper, and they're telling you that this stuff crumbles and disintegrates, gets into the ocean. Fish eat it, not a good thing, right? Pretty much same thing happens with this stuff. Gets into the ocean, right? Fish nibbles on it, it gets all over the place. Plus, it just doesn't look good, right? This stuff disintegrates. I saw this in the uh, canal one day uh, uh, in Culver City, right? They said, come out and take a look at this. Went out to the canal, this stuff was all over the place, crumbled up. Just didn't look good, right? So there's been a huge, huge uh, uh, folks are getting behind this to just uh, get rid of it. Period. It's been banned in several cities, several cities, including the city of Culver, which banned it from their restaurants for the most part. They can't stop you from going to the supermarket and buying it, but they just don't want it around. And here's what's unfortunate about that, both of these items. What's is unfortunate about it is big corporations, people need jobs. They're out there doing their jobs, they're making their star phone, they're making their plastic bags, the corporation is doing well, somehow this gets in the, the water, somehow this gets in the water and the canals, and guess what happens? What happens is, Folks come in and say we want to ban this. Okay, I, we need to get rid of this. It's an eyesore, and it's and I don't blame it. But you have to look at the other side of this, where these corporations are making this, giving folks jobs, etc. And think to yourself, this is a human problem. Okay, this is a human problem. This is our problem. I would say that ninety. 5% of this material that you find in the ocean is because people are basically drawing it there or, or close to an area where they may be drawing this stuff down and eventually it gets there instead of drawing it away. So on the one hand, I do understand why it should be banned. But on the other hand, it is a human problem. Right? And, 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 and those companies shouldn't be looked at like they're poison, like they're a piece of poison, because they're not. They're just doing what they've always done. Okay? So that's very, very important to, to, to remember. Um, right now, as far as, now again, this is a problem for us for the most part. And when you talk about styrofoam, recycling styrofoam, Quite honestly, it's the uh, buggy before the horse. And what I mean by that is people start making an uproar about this commodity. It's all over the place. Right? What I mean by buggy before the horse is the company said, we got to jump on this before they start doing something about us. They didn't have any place to recycle this. But they develop a place really quick. And the only thing that I know of that they can make out of styrofoam is, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the lining for a uh, picture frames, for the most part. They're getting better at it. They're finding other recycling outlets for it. But for now, it's the buggy before the horse. The horse. Well, how do they know this is going to happen this way? Okay. I get both ends of it. This material, film plastic, is a solid material, bad, extremely durable, more durable than your uh, paper bag, right? Our city has pretty much banned it and then bought it back in a compostable type of, of material. Any of your cities banned? Uh, this commodity are thinking about doing it or talking about it. Must be an LA County thing. Orange County won't do it without the state. Without the state, okay. They're, they're waiting for the 
state. Okay, now that's, that's, that's not a plastic grocery bag. That's a, well, it is. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. But we have a statewide ban on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, in, in, my, in my community, we, we ban okay. plastic bags. The single-use plastic bags. The single-use plastic bags. Bag. Exactly. And then they okay. kind of, they brought it back. I don't know why or how they brought it back, but if you look at this bag, it's not the normal bag. It's Who bunch of dots in it? Yeah, that's the, right? if you, that's the if you forgot to bring your bags, you buy you bu them. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly, exactly, exactly. So, uh, again, a very durable commodity, very strong commodity, uh, and, and it's really unfortunate. Let me tell you a little story. It's a little funny story. And again, I won't keep you long here. Uh, well, city of Clem uh, San Clemente is one of our cities. And the city of San Clemente came to us, and they said, Bob, you know, the whole state is in the uproar about plastic bags, grocery bags. Uh, this plastic company, the guy is like a billionaire. Uh, uh, this gentleman at uh, San Clemente said, this, this, this gentleman called me up, and he wants to do something about it. And I said, sure, have him come down, right? The guy come down with three or four guys, they're in a limousine, right, just to come down to CRNR and meet with little, little old me, right? So we sat down, we talked, and they came up with this idea, fabulous idea, fabulous. They said, hey, listen, pretty much, we don't want to lose our bagging opportunity here because this thing is like a freight train, Bob, and it's going to knock us all down, right? That's when this thing started to first happen. And I said, what do you want to do? So we have an idea. We're going to start in the city of San Clemente, the bag-to-bag -bag program. Anybody ever heard of that? It was advertised on cable for a little bit. There were advertised full-page ads in uh, uh, Orange County Register and the USA uh, Today. And here's how the system would work. They would send out rolls of blue fluorescence bags to every household in the community. Now, every household, it was their job to take all their film plastic and put it inside this fluorescent blue bag, tie it up, throw it in, in, the, in the recycling bin, right? So we did that. Trucks came down, dumped the material, and it was beautiful. You can see it from a distance. It almost glowed in the daytime. Right? These fluorescent blue bags, they were all over the place. Right? So we started picking, sorting that material out. We made these big old bales out of it. You guys know what a bale is, right? Just kind of like a bale of hay, but it's a bale of, of, of newspaper, a bale of, of in this case, uh, uh, plastic bags. Now you can put any film of plastic inside of this. So. They said, they came down, they visited, they said, we love it. Send it to us. Right? And they were in South Carolina. We shipped it to them. When we shipped it to them, they said, man, we love this. Let's continue to do it. So we did it a couple other times. Right? And it takes a long time to get to wait because paper bags, I mean, <coughs> plastic bags are very, very light. So um, we shipped another load. And then people started running out of those blue bags, right? So we called them up and we said, hey, we're going to need some more of those blue bags. Now, at this time, it, it had already expanded to like Santa Monica, Strano, and a couple few other cities. So this stuff was getting really expensive. So they said, we called them up and said, this thing is going well, send us some more bags. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't, excuse me, we don't need to send any more bags. What we're going to do is... We're going to start the back to back program with just the grocery bag. Forget about the fluorescent bags. Okay? So now you guys are going to be instructed to pick out these bags. Right? I don't have to tell you what happened. We did what they said. Right? But we noticed that those bales started to smell a little bit. Right? Cat poop, dog poop. What happens? We don't have time to look inside the bags. Don't have time to do that. Right? We're just pulling stuff up, putting it in the bales. They said, I said, I got a full load for you. A full load. <laughs> they said, send it to us. We 
accepted it. And my God, when they got those bands, they called me up, and I knew he wanted to call me every bad name that he could think of. They said, we opened up one bail yesterday, and there was poop all over the place. We opened up three the other day, same problem. I said, my God, I'm sorry to hear that. And he said, uh, I said, well, we need to go back to the blue bags. And he said, no, I think they've settled down a little bit regarding the bags. I think we kind of got them motivated because they were sending information to the state and publicizing this thing. Did a good job of it, by the way. And then they decided that, okay, don't send us those bags. We're not going to send you any blue bags. That's the end of it. It took all of, of nine months before that thing was back on. Uh, uh, everybody was talking about it. Let's get rid of the, uh, the, the bags. Okay? Now, what I failed to mention is that, boy, there's some lobbying out there that is incredible. Right? Powerful. More powerful than you can ever imagine. The lobbying for, to keep this out. Right? And the public for consumers. The lobbying for this is also been very powerful. It's not like the state can make a decision, and that's why you haven't seen it yet. Like the state can say, okay, we're going to uh, ban uh, uh, plastic bags. The lobbying system is so powerful that I think at one point the state did decide that they were going to ban either this or polypropylene, and then the lobbying system or whoever came in and sued the state. And the state said, okay, not now. Okay, that's just how powerful those guys are. Now, we're going to talk about one other thing, and that's going to be mixed plastic. Right? You were showing me something a little bit earlier uh, uh, that would probably go in the mix. You have this material, this is number one, number two. But we don't, we don't put these two together because this is probably about seven, eight, nine, ten cents more per pound than this is. So these two are seven. So you have your HDPE. You have, unfortunately, some PVC and other types of plastics, which will likely be HDPE, but they're going to be HDPE in buckets, uh, toys, etc. So that material is going to be separate from these bottles. The reason that they like the bottles is that they know that there's at least a 99% chance it's going to be uh, HDPE, the good stuff. They don't know what they're going to find if you put all of this stuff with the other HDPE. It's like, we don't trust that. Okay? So you have your other material, which is your, we call mixed plastic. So everything else will go in the mix. Right, the clothes hampers, the uh, barrels, you know, just about anything you could, th you could think of. So, at one point, we were shipping that material to China. So, as these guys were talking about earlier, China said, no, we don't want it. You can't ship that material to us. And what China was doing with it, frankly, frankly, is that they were taking those bales getting all the HDPE out of it, and then the rest of it, they were drawing it into the landfill. That's what they were doing with it for the most part. Okay? It's unfortunate, but that's how the cycle goes. We ship thousands and thousands of tons of material all over the world. A lot of it goes to the Asian bloc. You have to keep in mind that China has pretty much closed us off. Okay, China has pretty much closed us off, but there are still some markets for this material in the United States. Lastly, um, most of this material here is, 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 is mixed money for the most part. I'm not too much worried about China. The problem, I guess, with China is that they were pretty much the only game in town for us. So when they cut us off, it was tough to find other markets. But the entrepreneur, right, the person that wants to make some money, he's already processing this as an opportunity.
utility form stuff. We're seeing it already. It's starting to open up. So we're happy to see that for the most part. So that's my spill. Thank you very, very much.